So we bring in the we bring in the human di uh, dimension to, to the debt crisis. So basically, in 2020, following the COVID-19 pandemic, it was estimated that government revenues in Africa will drop by 45 billion. Right. So this is the context, and then. Added to that, the depreciation was further compounded by African countries' high level of debt, which increased to about $40 billion annually. At the time, South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa was the head of the AU, you know, and then he said that the, the continent's debt was expected to increase by 4.4 percentage points of GDP and would likely trigger a debt crisis. So this is basically a context that I would use if I'm writing a story on debt, uh, you know, uh, yeah. And then basically the biggest concern was that after years of positive economic growth in, Africa, in African countries across different regions, the pandemic was going to start actually impacting this growth and decreasing the, the standard of living for normal everyday Africans. So this is why it's important, right? So already we're understanding that because of the pandemic, normal people will be impacted and they'll be affected. Okay. And then get most recently, we know that there's the Russian-Ukraine war going on. And this is what the International Monetary Forum said, I mean fund, said so the crisis would be worrisome for emerging countries. Uh, the statement came from uh, the managing director of the IMF. The very same time, literally I think a week ago, or two weeks ago, the European Central Bank, oh there you go, <laughs> that's why it wasn't working. Uh, the European Central Bank and the IMF revised their GDP revisions, right? So why is this important? This is important because African countries are usually quite dependent with European countries. And if they're going to revise the GDP numbers or revise the inflation figures upwards, that means we are going to suffer through inflation increases. So that is the direct impact of what happens between these global uh, decisions by these uh, central bank institutions. So immediately, this forced policymakers and Afri African country central bankers to revise their own country-specific inflation pressures and country growth as well, right? Ah. So what happened? Literally still two weeks ago, the World Bank Group Vice President for Equitable Growth, Finance and Institutions, and the Met Jill basically said, the war means emerging countries' economies such as South Africa, Turkey, and China, which were expected to grow about 2, 2 to 3, 5 percent respectively, would see their growth outlook cut, right? And when that happens, it means that uh, when there's no growth, there's no employment, there's no jobs, people are affected, right? So this is the context where we talk about how global, um, global sentiment and global happenings directly have an impact on African citizens. So immediate in interventions, which were also just uh, announced a week or two ago, the IMF had a briefing with African country finance ministers, basically all the, pol the important people, the people who decide about the movement of African countries' economics, uh, to say, okay, what plans, are you go what plans have you put together, or what plans are you going to put together to make sure that the gains that were starting to be made post-COVID, so even though there's still different variants coming across, but these variants are not as bad as they were two years ago. So even though, I mean, even now there's COVID, but because of vaccinations, we are working around masks, right? So all those gains are now, they might now be reversed uh, because of the war in, 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 in Russia, I mean, the war in Ukraine by Russia, and also uh, because of the potenti potentiality of, of new variants of COVID coming. So what is the direct impact of the war on households and consumers? That's us. These are people who read our newspapers. These are people who are actually wanting to know what this whole crisis means for them as individuals 
as family members, as households, as consumers, as firms. So the war will impact African countries through four main channels. And we've started to experience this in, you know, in our respective countries. We've seen increased food prices, higher fuel prices, lower tourism revenues, and something slightly more complex. It might mean that African countries now cannot access international capital markets, right? So now this is the direct link between what is happening in the global sphere to how this is happening is going to affect us, right? So because of these happenings, African countries will now have to revise their budgets, right? And when you revise your budgets, you have set aside some money for different programs, right? And now because of these issues, the money that you've set aside is no longer enough. And you must also start thinking about, okay, where are we going to get money to actually deal with these issues? So, this is what's currently happening, especially in South Africa. Uh, because of the crisis, literally on Thursday, the South African Reserve Bank is going to have uh, its, its MPC meeting, and we are expecting a rate hike. So, along with all these possibilities, this, I mean, you know, uh, the crisis, all this is also happening. Also because in South Africa, in February, uh, the Minister of Finance actually spoke about, you know, the budget and the budget allocations. But because of the war, those have been thrown out the window. So it's possible that because of the war, budgets will have to be reallocated, again, possibly increasing, well, not possibly, which will definitely increase uh, different countries' debt profiles. Okay. So yes, does this mean more debt for Africa? The IMF even asked that African countries to redouble and prioritize their efforts to advance reforms that promote resilience. The fund also said it is ready to help African countries address the repercussions of the war. Right? So this is meaning that already putting money aside, uh, as we heard from you know, one of the esteemed speakers yesterday, that in a crisis, these big institutions, they come and they offer you money, right? So if you don't have any money, chances are a lot of African countries will come and take this extra money that is denominated in US dollars. What are the implications of that? More debt for Africa. The African Development Bank also set aside one billion to boost wheat production in Africa, right? So this also happened within the last week, right? So we are seeing that money is being offered to African countries because of the current crisis, right? So we are actually just seeing it in action. Uh, so what is the link between public debt and the impact on its citizens, right? So, uh, uh, Adrian, is going, Adrian wrote a paper which explores the linkages that exist between public debt, inequalities, and illicit financial flows. And he's one of the panelists that will speak on the actual theoretical linkages that actually affect, so how do we move from debt to citizens? What is the face of, how are citizens going to be impacted directly by the increase of debt that we are likely to see happening, right? Um, so, in summary, he will show you how sovereign debt continues to grow funds and that the country could use... So, the countries that were mainly set aside to use for social programs. So, these social programs, you know, uh, I'll use South Africa as an example. South Africa's constitution demands that the, financial, uh, the, the Ministry of Finance set aside money for, for social welfare, right? So... This money goes towards free education in basic and high school. It goes towards free health, you know. So now when this happens, obviously those monies that were set aside towards those social issues are going to be impacted. So who depends on free health and who depends on free education? And who depends on grant? So South Africa has also known that it gives a certain amount of money to child grants because children cannot go to school hungry. 
So now with all these issues, money might be actually removed from these social programs to pay for debt that you are borrowing. Because when you borrow debt, especially uh, dollar-denominated debt, the amount that you have to pay in interest has become so high that it takes away from other social programs, right? So, yeah. So basically, uh, before this, uh, I can share my presentation with you if you're interested. You will see the amount of money that was allocated to the social programs that I've just mentioned. But now to the, oh, sorry. <laughs> but to the actual core of this discussion. So how does all this theory actually affect everyday people? In 2020, when COVID started, a lot of people lost their jobs. So these are people in the unskilled labor, skilled labor, and because people who worked in the informal sector could no longer go to the markets and sell whatever it is they sell, uh, they could no longer make money. So in South Africa, what the government did is it put aside or uh, introduced what it calls a COVID-19 COVID grant of 350 rands a month. However, this grant was removed, uh, this is 2021, it was removed end of March 2021, right? And the reason it was removed is because government said it can't afford to give uh, people, that this was not meant to be a, a permanent grant, this was meant to be a short-term grant. And because the economies are slowly moving, it can't afford to take this money and pay people. So they literally removed money that they, was give, they were given to the unemployed people during the COVID-19 crisis, and then they were putting it towards servicing debt, right? So this is around March 2021. Okay. Um, and what happened, what, ha oh, sorry. I think this is the older, I have to go back. Okay, I'll just speak to it. So what happened in South Africa, you know that in July 2021, South Africa saw its biggest, biggest riots in the country. So of course with international media and also the South African government, what was reported is that people were rioting because the former president Jacob Zuma had gone to jail, right? So this is true. However, the people who were rioting were people who had links to Jacob Zuma. In the space of two days, the, the protests moved from uh, the targeting of infrastructure, the targeting of uh, roads, you know, the cutting of resources, to breaking into malls and stealing food, you know? So obviously the people that are very upset that Jacob Zuma is in jail were not the same people that were breaking into malls, stealing rice. We had grandmothers going into malls stealing rice, stealing food because they were hungry. So analysis that came after was that even though this, this, these riots were first instigated by Jacob Zuma going to jail, the high unemployment rate in South Africa and government's decision to remove the COVID-19 grant to pay out and use it towards servicing debt was the reason this happened. People were starving people were poor, people could not afford to work, and yet the one source of social relief was taken from them, right? So this is basically the human face of debt in, 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 as you see it happen in reality, right? So, we, so literally, this is in July, in August, the government was forced to reinstate the COVID-19 debt because they, they, they understood that the unemployed 12.2 million people of South Africa uh, did not have access to funds, and then they started to look for other places to reallocate uh, funding from other, from other services. But then it, that means that we are going to see health suffer, and we are going to see education suffer, because even the money that was set aside for free higher education was now being moved from there to pay for social grants, you see. So in my, this is uh, the link between debt, the increase of debt, the servicing of debt, 
and how we can see this play out in real life, impacting people that are dependent on these social programs.